Well, good morning, beloved church. Like always, what a joy and treat it is to be with you on the Lord's Day, to worship Him in prayer and song and, and giving, and now we get to worship Him in the teaching and hearing of His Word. Uh, beloved, as Christians who look to the Bible as our standard for our faith and our life, we must be ready to defend the basis for our belief. For example, if someone were to ask you, why do you believe the Bible? How would you answer? Some would probably and honestly say, well, that's what I was taught as a child, so I just do. Others would simply say, I believe the Bible because it is God's word. And of course, you would be correct. But then comes some of the most common objections. Well, wasn't the Bible written by men? How could you be so sure that they didn't make things up to fit their narrative, to fit their stories? Isn't there contradictions found in the Bible? Do you really believe the fanciful stories of the Bible? A man being swallowed up by a great fish talking snake, talking donkey, a worldwide flood, dead people being brought to life. Really? You really believe that? To which, again, many would respond, yes, that's what I believe because it's in the Bible, which is the Word of God. Now let me ask you this. Which of the following statement is correct? The Bible is true because I believe it. Or, the Bible is true, and that's why I believe it. There's a difference there, beloved. Things aren't simply true because you believe them. And this principle applies to Scripture as well. You know, last week, Michael did a great job of reminding us of the ways God has revealed himself to humanity. First, through general or natural revelation, which is God's revelation of himself, his attributes, through his creation. One honestly cannot look at creation and, and not acknowledge that God exists. You know, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Now, from this text, we clearly see that God's general revelation, or his natural revelation, if you will, is condemning in that no one has a legitimate excuse for not believing in God based on God's witness of himself in what he has created. However, as also Michael explained, God's general revelation or natural revelation of himself does not save a person. The knowledge of how God seeks to save sinners comes only through God's special revelation. This, of course, is found in Jesus Christ himself, the incarnate word. For us, we read in Colossians 2.9, it says, For in him, that is in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now, there is no greater example of special revelation than what we find in Jesus Christ. But also, through his special revelation, in the written word, the law, the prophets, the writings, the apostolic witness, which together make up what we know as the Old and New Testament, which make up what we know as our Bible today. Now, therefore, we know that the Bible is a collection of 66 books written by 40 different authors on three different continents and three different languages over a period of 1,500 years. But the question remains, why should we believe it and why should it be the standard of our faith and our life? Again, like Michael reminded us last week, that yes, although the Bible is, a, is comprised of 66 books written by 40 different authors on three different continents and three different languages over a period of 1,500 years, and nevertheless has one essential constant, and that it's God, God's inspiration. Now, in this sense, the Bible has only one author, and it is God. 
Now, as we were taught also last week, the Bible was God-breathed in that every word written by the human authors was divinely inspired by God as it was superintended by His Holy Spirit. Meaning that the words of Scripture are those words of God even as it was written by the 40 different authors. Human authors. Now, here we have then the doctrine of the origin or inspiration of the Bible. That, again, we covered last week. Now, this morning, I want to add to our study of the doctrine of Scripture by looking at what naturally follows the truth of the origin and inspiration of Scripture, and that is the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. Admittedly, the use of Technical or theological terms sometimes makes it seem that these are way too complicated to understand by the average churchgoer. But beloved, let me remind you, you are not called to be the average churchgoer. I don't think that should be the case, at least not for this church, since we are all about the exposition of the Word of God. So, what do we mean when we say that the Bible is infallible, and inerrant, and why does it matter to our Christian life? Norman Geisler, who went home to to be with the Lord in 2019, along with one of my dearest professors at the Master Seminary, co-authored, co-edited a book titled Vital Issues in the Inerrancy Debate, published in 2015. In it, Norman Geisler states, it has been said that a table must have at least three legs to stand. Take away any one of these three legs and it will surely topple. In much the same way, the Christian faith stands on three legs. These three legs are the inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of Scripture. Take away one, and like the table, the divine authority of the Christian faith will surely topple. He continues by saying, these three ins, quote-unquote, complement each other, yet each express a slightly different distinction in our understanding of Scripture. So this morning, we're going to look at the second and third legs of this table. Since last week, we looked at the first leg of the table, which is inspiration. And agreeing with Geisler that without all three, the divine authority of our Christian faith will surely topple. So I think it's important that we go now before the Lord and ask that he would guide us in his wisdom as we begin our study. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this morning and ask that you, as the person who inspired, who would breathe out your word, who divinely superintended your word, we come now as men and women and in our flesh, ignorant, asking that you would teach us. Father, thank you that it is only through your Holy Spirit that you keep us from error as we study your word. And therefore, this morning, we commit this time to you, asking that you go before us as we discuss the issues of inerrancy and infallibility. Again, we ask that you go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, as Michael taught us last week, the Bible is inspired, that is God-breathed, which naturally points to its origin, that God himself, as Paul states in 2 Timothy 3.16, breathed out his word. This, of course, is the first leg of this table that God in Geyser's example. Now, the second leg of this table is infallibility. Infallibility. I know that's a big theological term, but we ought not to be afraid of it. Write it down, and I'll explain it. Infallibility. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines infallible as incapable of error, not liable to mislead, deceive, or disappoint. The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as the quality or fact of being infallible or exempt from liability to err, or the quality of being unfailing. 
Now, Geisler goes on to explain it this way. Infallibility speaks to the authority and enduring nature of the Bible. To be infallible means that something is incapable of failing and therefore is permanently binding and cannot be broken. Article 11 of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy of 1978 puts it this way. We affirm that Scripture, having been given by divine inspiration, is infallible. So that, so that far from misleading us, it is true and reliable in all the matters it addresses. Incidentally, beloved, I will be quoting frequently from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy of 1978 because its content has been generally accepted among conservative evangelicals. In fact, to be accepted as a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, one must affirm their agreement to this statement in order to be accepted. That's how widely uh, the, the, the spread is of its acceptance. Now, let us move on to define inerrancy. What do we mean by inerrancy? In Grudem's Systematic Theology, he defines it this way. The inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Feinberg says, inerrancy means that when all the facts are known, the scriptures in their original and original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be wholly true in everything that they affirm, whether that has to do with doctrine or morality or with the social, physical, or life sciences. MacArthur and Mayhew in Biblical Doctrine put it this way, inerrancy means literally without error. When applied to Scripture, it means that the Bible is without error in the original copies. It is therefore free when properly interpreted from affirming Anything that is untrue or contrary to fact. Now, beloved, did you hear some similarities in these definitions? All three, emphasis, all three uh, def definitions emphasize, if you caught it, the inerrancy of the original manuscripts, the autographs, or copies. This is very important since infallibility and inerrancy apply only to the documents that are no longer in existence. These are the actual documents written by, by, by Moses, by Isaiah, by Paul and John. Those documents are not in existence anymore. So when we speak of the infallibility and inerrancy of the Bible, we're ascribing that to the original copies. Also, Notice that Feinberg and MacArthur slash Mayhew add the phrase when properly interpreted. This is absolutely essential, beloved. You will find that many accusations of the Bible containing errors or contradictions boil down to the improper interpretation of the text. And that's why I, I, I uh, uh, really appreciate both Feinberg and MacArthur and Mayhew adding that inerrancy and infallibility only not, not only have to deal with the original autographs or manuscripts, but that it must be also be properly interpreted. Now, beloved, as we put these three legs together of this table, inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy, we have something like this. Since all Scripture has been inspired, that is, breathed out by God, and therefore is infallible, then it must be inerrant. That is, without error and incapable of affirming anything that is untrue or contrary to fact. Or put a simpler way, the truth claims of the Bible are incapable of misleading or error since they are breathed out directly from a God who is perfect. Now, some of you may be asking, so where do these terms come from? 
Are these terms even in the Bible? Preacher, thus far you've only quoted definition from systematicians. I know they're systematic theologies. But what is the biblical ground for all of this? That is a great question. Beloved, let us go ahead and start with the ultimate authority. Let us start with Jesus himself. Since there's no higher authority, what does he say? About scripture. Please turn in your Bibles to John 17. And we'll begin reading in verses 12 through 17. John 17. And we are interested in verses 12 through 17. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus says, While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you gave, you have given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Here Christ is quoting Psalm 41, 9. Here clearly Christ acknowledges, obviously, that the Psalms are scripture. Moving on to verse 13. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Here, beloved, Jesus says that God's word It's truth. And since it is the truth, then it must be without error or even incapable of erring. If there was only one verse, I would suggest to you that this is it. All we need to say the Bible is infallible and it's inerrant. It is incapable of misleading. And it is without error. Just from this one verse. Your word is truth. Truth is that which conforms to that which is real and actual. Therefore, the scripture, according to Christ, conforms to that which is real and actual. Your word is truth. Beloved, I hope that even now you start seeing the ramifications of saying that the Bible contains error. If this is true, then Jesus lied. God's word is perfect and it could not fail in what it teaches and in what is designed to accomplish. Listen to what Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. Responding to the Pharisees in John chapter 10, verse 35, Jesus says, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, And the scripture cannot be broken. One last one. Peter in Peter chapter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20, 24, and 25, quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 and following, says, For all flesh is like grass, all is gone, all and all its glory like the flowers of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures. Forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. How about in the Old Testament? King David in Psalm one in, in Psalm twelve, verse six declares, The words of the Lord are pure words, he says, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. So c- completion. It, remain, it, it speaks of the completion of refinement. Now, beloved, the Hebrew word for pure here means pure as in substance. In other words, God's word is free from extraneous elements of any kind. 
It is perfect. It is without defect of any kind or any form. Just like Psalm 19 verse 8 says, The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's pure. It's free of defect, of pollution. Psalm 119 verses 140. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. Now, beloved, although the terms infallible and inerrant are not explicit in the biblical text, I hope that you can see that they are necessarily implicit. When addressing the topics of the Bible's inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy, it all boils down to one thing. And you need to keep this in mind. It boils down to the very character of God. Writing to Titus, Paul in Titus 1, verses 1 through 3, writes this. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even in his word, in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Now the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, basically says the same thing. When he says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us, the writer of Hebrews says. Now church, the reason we must believe in the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, it is because the Scriptures originated from an infallible and inerrant God. There's no other option. There is no other option. To think that the Scriptures contain or teach error or anything non-factual is an affront to the Scriptures' divine author. Yet, it amazes me how many people, even within evangelicalism, say that they believe in the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, and yet claim that the Bible writers, the biblical writers, misspoke or made mistakes in their writings. Perhaps you yourself have come across people who claim that the Bible contains errors or less than factual, uh, less than, than factual areas in, in, in some areas. And never mind the regular person on the street, but what's worse, actual pastors and theologians who believe and teach this in their churches and seminaries. With an evangelicalism, Maybe you didn't know this, but there are variations on the doctrine of inerrancy. Allow me to briefly explain the three most popular views, and these I've taken out of my class notes from Dr. Snyder's Theology One class at TMS. I'm just going to give you, there's more, but I'm going to give you the, top, the most popular, the top three. There are those within evangelicalism that believe in limited inerrancy. Limited inerrancy affirms that the Bible is inerrant in all matters of faith and practice, as well as in matters which can be empirically verified. Inspiration does not grant modern understanding. Hence, the Bible may contain errors of science or history but it did secure fully truthful teaching about belief and behavior. Okay? My beloved, these are men and women that you probably have heard of that ascribe to this. The second is functional inerrancy. This affirms that the purpose of the Bible is to bring people to salvation and growth in grace. The Bible accomplishes its purpose without fail. 
Functional inerrancy affirms that the Bible is sufficiently accurate in, in factual matters to accomplish its purpose, which, according to this, this, this definition, is to uh, bring people to salvation and growth and grace. I suggest to you, beloved, that the Bible is way more than that. To start off. Well, anyway, it affirms that the Bible is sufficiently accurate in factual matters to accomplish its purpose, but seeks to avoid describing the inerrancy of Scripture primarily in terms of facticity. Instead, it speaks of the Bible in terms of trustworthiness and faithfulness. In other words, yeah, I believe the Bible is functionally inerrant, meaning that, I, as I understand the Bible's purpose is to bring people to salvation, the Bible is good enough and accomplishes that. It's inerrant functionally. It accomplishes its goal. Now, stop and think for a moment, beloved. How can these, how can any one of these harmonize, how can any, anyone harmonize these views of limited or functional inerrancy with the scripture passages we looked at a while ago? How can you harmonize that? Can a perfect God err when speaking on the topic of science? Can a perfect God err when speaking on the topic of science? No. Can a perfect God err when speaking on the topic of history? No. Of course not. But those that hold to the above views of inerrancy will say, although God is incapable of erring, man is not. And given that God used fallible and errant men to write scripture, then there is not a problem saying that the Bible contains error. No, 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 no. Beloved, this is known as accommodation. And you probably will hear that term if you read any of the, of the systematic theologies. Accommodation, which has recently been redefined to mean, again, quoting from biblical doctrine, as God being forced to include error in the composition of Scripture because he used fallible human authors and language. These claim that since God used finite human beings, human writers, who were sinners to write his word, the text is therefore liable to all the errors of finite, sinful human beings. They even go so far as to say that the use of these human means of, a comp of composition make errors or makes errors inevitable in the process. There are pastors, theologians, who teach us to the churches and seminaries that because God used fallible men, then it is possible and almost a foregone conclusion that in God accommodating to man that he would allow some mistakes. Quoting further, they conclude that the Bible is true in matters of faith and practice because these are at a general principle level. However, they maintain that there can be and are factual errors throughout the Bible due to the fallible human instrumentality God used in the composition of the text. Beloved, do you see any problem with this? Is God so inept that he must accommodate to sinful human beings in the writing of his word to the extent that God would allow human errors in producing scripture? What does this say of the Holy Spirit who, is, who superintended every single biblical author to write exactly what God wanted written? If the Bible contains factual errors due to the fallible human instrumentality, then the Holy Spirit failed in superintending the writing of the Bible. Perish the thought. This leaves now, or moves to the third view. Natural inerrancy. It affirms the truth of everything in the Bible to the degree of precision intended by the author. This is crucial to understand, beloved. The truth of everything in the Bible is to be affirmed to the degree of precision intended by the author. 
In other words, the Bible is not a science book. It is not a history book or a medical desk reference book. It's not. The Bible does not intend to teach you about the periodic table or tectonic plates or how to perform open heart surgery or fix your car. That's not the Bible's intent. It was written to reveal a holy God to unholy people and by His grace and mercy save some of them as He looks to restore all things in Christ, all the things that sin tainted through the fall. Beloved, the natural Inerrancy view also usually regards biblical references to scientific matters as phenomenal. That is, how they appear to the writer. These are not scientists. If to the writer appears that the sun goes down or comes up, that's how he writes it. But that is totally acceptable within human language. It's not that he is factually, oh, he is factually incorrect. The sun doesn't rise. In fact, the sun never moves. It's like, are you kidding me? He's using human language. It's how they appear to the writer and does not seek to harmonize every detail of Scripture because it recognizes that the authors wrote for different purposes. Now, beloved, this view is detailed in the Chicago Statement in Articles 11 and 12. Let me read them to you where it says, We affirm that Scripture, having been given by divine inspiration, is infallible so that Far from misleading us, it is true and reliable in all the matters it addresses. When we deny that it is possible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and errant in its assertions, infallibility and inerrancy may be distinguished but not separated. Article 12. We affirm that the scripture is in its entirety inerrant, being free from all falsehood, fraud, or deceit. We deny that biblical infallibility and inerrancy are limited to spiritual, religious, or redemptive themes, exclusive of, assert exclusive of assertions in the field of history and science. We further deny that scientific, hypothes scientific hypotheses about earth history may, may, may properly be used to overturn the teaching of Scripture on creation and the flood. Beloved, when, when one possesses any other view than the holistic view of infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, the possibilities of misinterpreting and wrong teaching of the text abound. I'm going to give you an example. Please turn to Matthew chapter 27. We're interested in verses 51 and 53. This is a Matthew's account of what happened after our Lord's resurrection. Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. In 2010, Dr. Mike Lycona, an evangelical professor, wrote a book titled The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. In his book, he suggests that the account of the resurrected saints walking through the city might be apocalyptic imagery. Like Clona classifies these verses as apocalyptic imagery and possible poetic lore and legend, and therefore teaches that it is highly unlikely that these events took place. I ask you, is this consistent with the doctrine of the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture? It is not at all consistent. Can you imagine having this person as your pastor and telling you, as he's exposing the Gospel of Matthew, and you get to this passage when he tells you, oh, 
And based and, and, and what we just read, beloved, particularly in verses 52 and 53, I want you to know that is, it is highly improbable that that actually happened. Because you see, this is midrash, this is poetic, this is apocalyptic terminology. Can you imagine if he told you that these things didn't happen based on his understanding of Hebrew midrash lore or legend? How would that make you feel about the rest of the scripture? Naturally, at some point, one is liable to start questioning the validity of God's word. And once you start down that road, you'll end up in a horrible place. Just ask Adam and Eve who doubted God's word, has God really said? And you know, and those that do not ascribe to the holistic doctrine of inerrancy and infallibility of scripture, in a sense, make people question, has God really said? Well, pastor, why don't you tell me? Theology professor, why don't you, uh, uh, seminary professor, why don't you tell me? Well, here it is. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked the expert. Well, you see here, this is Hebrew midrash. This is legend. This is lore. There's a different type of uh, uh, genre. Now, do we believe in genres and approaching it according? Of course. Narrative is narrative. Poetry is poetry. Of course. But to say that those genres uh, 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 say uh, that the scriptures it, the, do not say what it says, that is they, what, it, what they say it says? Absolutely not. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when we say that the Bible is infallible and inerrant, it only applies to the, the, the parts, uh, uh, the original autographs. In other words, the actual documents written by 40 authors, and we touched on this, those are the things that are inerrant. And, and as I was thinking, unfortunately, thank God that those are no longer existent. Can you imagine if they were existent? You know what people, you, can you imagine what people do, what would do if they actually had Paul's writing or John's writing? They would worship it. Thank God that they're not there. Nevertheless, from faithful copies of these infallible and inerrant originals, our Bibles came. Now, some copies may contain some weaknesses, even errors due to transmission or translation. But this in no way invalidates the infallibility and inerrancy for none of these errors, either presumed or actual, change the meaning of the text in any way. If you were to look at the textual variants, it's like, why is this in this text? Why is this in this text? Why did they omit this? Oh, they were hide, hiding something. No, not at all. If you look at those things, they're so minute that they don't even change the meaning of a text. A word here and there might be left out, but it never changes the meaning of the text. Again, even slight copying errors do not change God's superintention of his word. Now, this is not to say, beloved, that, that there are not difficult passages in Scripture that may make us take a deeper look to fully understand them. There are some areas like, th that will leave you scratching your head. Let's look at two of them in the interest of time. For example, let's turn to Mark chapter, Mark chapter 2, verse 25 and 26. Mark chapter 2, verses 20, 25 and 26. This text is often used to insinuate that there are errors in the Scriptures. Mark 20, it says, and he says to them, this is Jesus speaking now. He says, have you never heard that David did what David did uh, when he was in need and, in, and, and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of uh, Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Where he says that in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, is peculiar to Mark. In other words, only Mark has this compared to Matthew and Luke. And therefore it is debated that because according to 1 Samuel chapter 21 verse 1, which says that it was Ahimelech, the father of Abiathar, was the high priest, not Abiathar. Okay, so people claim, which is, and I chose this one because... This is Jesus speaking. Well, Jesus surely messed up. For it was not Abiathar that was high priest during that time. Because 
1 Samuel tells us that it was Ahimelech, his father. All right. So we have an apparent contradiction. However, we're, we know that Abithar, if you read the text, especially in 1 Samuel, he was the only high priest to escape Saul's slaughter of the priests. And he was well known throughout David's era. Thus, Jesus' reference is fitting. Similarly, the, 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 uh, the, the Bible knowledge commentary says, Abiathar became the high priest shortly after Abimelech and proved more prominent than he, thus justifying the use of his name here. So here we have an apparent, not actual contradiction. It just takes a little digging and using your tools and your head to figure it out. You just have to go read it. It's like, oh, I can see why Jesus used that. Again, far be it from us to say that Jesus misspoke. Last one. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. This is also a very popular one. Jesus sharing a parable. Verse 31, and he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is a this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nests in its branches. Here we have God incarnate declare that the mustard seed is smaller than all other seeds. But the errantists, the skeptics, say, wait a second. This is not true. There are smaller seeds than the mustard seed in the world. For example, the orchid seed is so small and fine that it's almost dust-like. So there you have it. The Bible is not infallible. It is not inerrant. It contains statements contrary to known facts. And again, I chose these because Jesus spoke both of these. Let me ask you a question. Is there a real contradiction to botanical science in this verse? Is Christ, through whom God created the world, Hebrews 1-2, truly unaware is he truly unaware that a mustard seed is, is bigger than an orchid seed, both of which he created? It's ludicrous to even contemplate such statements. Of course he's not unaware. So, is Christ guilty of stating false information? Again, ludicrous. What is Christ doing here? Please note that Jesus was not comparing the mustard seed to all other seeds in the world, but to seeds that local Palestinian farmers might have while sowing their fields. It's a parable. Look at the context. Context is king. Again, let me remind you, inerrancy affirms the truth of everything in the Bible to the degree of precision intended by the author. Is Jesus here addressing a botanist convention? No, he's not. Speaking a parable about a farmer. He is using far, a farming parable that his audiences would clearly understand with the seed that they were aware of. Context is king. Now, beloved, there are many other examples of apparent contradictions in Scripture that people bring up. And time does not allow to look at any more of them, but you need to rest assured that there's not one of those apparent contradictions that, not yet, that cannot be accounted for and adequately explained. And I say this to emphasize the following point. As John MacArthur says, the evidence available today enables textual scholars to hold the confidence that scripture translations today possess more than 99% of the original autographs. What you have in your hand is not infallible and errant. 
but it's 99%. It possesses more than 99% of the original autographs in them. This means that even with all the copies of copies of copies of the original autographs, we can trust that we possess in our Bibles God's very word, which he has kept from error and has faithfully superintended it, not only its accuracy, but its dissemination to the world. Beloved, I hope you can see how important the doctrine of inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of the Bible is to your faith, to our life. For as the three legs under the table, as Garza said, take one away, take inspiration away, take inerrancy away, or take infallibility away, the table will topple. The divine authority of our Christian faith will topple because the divine authority of our Christian faith is solely rooted in Scripture. Can you trust your Bible, beloved? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Why? Because a holy, infallible, and inerrant God breathed it out. Now, loved ones, one thing is to say that you trust the Bible, but yet another thing is to prove that the Bible is authoritative in your life. Michael, Lord willing, will cover that next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us in this, these two weeks to dive a little bit more uh, into the doctrine of your word. Father, we pray that as we discuss these topics that the love of Scripture would be grow gr to, to greater depths in our heart. Oh, Father, and how I pray now that this information that has been received may not simply fall on deaf ears. Lord, we know that sometimes technical terms, theological terms, tend to blur things up for people who are just barely wondering about the faith, but we know that it's important to address them. Lord, I do pray that if there's anyone in this room that is not a believer, that sat through this sermon or lecture, if you will, that is confused, I, I pray that you would just open their eyes, first and foremost, to your holiness, that you draw them onto salvation. For it's only those of us who are saved that can truly understand all that is involved in the inspiration and the infallibility and inerrancy of the Bible and why it matters and why it's so crucial. So I pray, Lord, that you would save any that would not that, uh, that does not know Christ as Lord and Savior that's uh, within our midst or earshot of my voice. So, Father, we again, we just thank you. And for the rest of us, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not less, left yourself without a witness, and we thank you that we can trust it completely. Your word is truth. And there's nothing that needs, that needs to be said above that. Your word is truth. Father, may we walk in it for your glory and for the benefit of the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.